Hello, so my name is Martin Bechtold. I'm affiliated with the architecture department. I teach in the technology area there. And so, since I don't know very much about landscape, I thought I'd warm us all up to this session with just some thoughts on fabrication issues in architecture, just to bring us some issues, and then we can see what we can cover through the lectures and the discussion afterwards. <coughs> Um, I interpreted this session as essentially digital fabrication, since this is focused on the digital, and fabrication in that context would sort of almost imply that. So uh, I'm going to comment on that a little bit. Because um, I, I, I sort of felt like both older brother and younger brother in this session, and older brother, because what well, we've actually been doing digital fabrication and architecture for a while, so yes, uh, and younger brother, because I don't know anything about landscape. So, um, so in architecture, there's been some issues that have been floating in this big area of uh, fabrication that might be worthwhile to just, just bring up. Um, first of all, I think it's a sort of new culture of digital representations that are almost uh, coming along with the desire to make things uh, using devices that are not controlled by people but by computers. There may be robots, there may be numerically controlled machines. So with this new culture of representation, we're essentially kind of, kind of taking on a mode of design that is really the abstraction of making. So that's a different mindset from a purely representational visual pursuit of modeling. Um, and um, the kind of second issue that I know we have sort of struggled with in architecture is the issue of scale uh, of the things that we can make and the issue of where we make them, either on site or off site. So obviously in, in architecture and in landscape architecture as well, prefabrication has been sort of pre a pretty common way of making things. Um, the issue of scale in landscape, of course, landscapes can be very large. Uh, we discussed yesterday, as we had Mark Simmons here, uh, that yes, there are some very large machines that mill out pieces for aircraft wings. They're about 240 feet long and about 40 feet wide. That's about the largest CNC milling machine in the United States. So we're actually the scale issue, we're actually getting pretty close to landscape scale. Uh, and there were, of course, at some point also systems in place in Japan where entire high rise buildings were constructed on site with largely automated machines and devices that were essentially large scale, full scale robots. <coughs> so, yes, we can address the issue of scale in different ways. So, maybe we can think about these things a bit in the session. Um, but so next issue is practice and the changes in practice that have come along with issues of digital fabrication and the associated shift in computational modeling and the sort of, yeah, just these new forms of practice that have formed in architecture where we see, for example, uh, legal entities forming around the production and design of certain parts of buildings where fabricators, engineers, and architects form companies just for a project to kind of uh, manage uh, the risk mitigation as the designer's model is now used to actually produce directly what is otherwise located in the fabricator shop. Uh, fourth issue, maybe just to think about, is the drivers of uh, this exciting world of digital fabrication. What is driving that development? Uh, is it kind of efficiencies of process? Is it productivity? Is it performance? Is it design? So I think we'll see a range of different issues addressed um, in the presentation. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here and introduce uh, um, the, the speakers. And uh, Pierre Boulanger is, is joining me here in providing the kind of faculty bookends of stability for this session here. Um, and I should probably introduce you now, and then I'll introduce the speakers. Because uh, I think we want to hear from you after the presentation. So Pierre uh, is on the faculty of the Landscape uh, Architecture Department here. Uh, and um, his research is, is focused on the convergence of urbanism, landscape, and ecology in the related fields of planning, design, and engineering. Um, his research in digital landscape technologies focuses on the design and representation of ecological processes that lie at the interface of geographic information systems and global position systems. Uh, those interests started initially with the creation of the Fab Lab at the University of Toronto uh, with a major infrastructure grant from the Canada Foundation for Innovation. So I hear from here as a respondent to the two lectures. And the first presentation will be by David Ma, 
who is, of course, on the faculty of this school, and he's been here for a few years uh, as a lecturer in the Department of Landscape Architecture. Uh, before coming here, he was teaching at Cornell and at the Architecture Association in London, where you were part of the Landscape Urbanism Program. Um, and he's also conducted workshops at, uh, in China and Korea, and has worked and practiced with a number of the well-known practices, such as Foreign Office Architects, Zaha Hadid and David Ajay, none of which I believe are landscape architects, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, in those companies, he was engaged with large-scale projects, master plans in London, Beijing, and then a Plata de Miguel Hernandez in Spain. Uh, you're currently practicing together with Lyra, who's right there. Uh, you practice Asensio Mar, and there's a number of active projects on your well, not drawing boards, I guess, uh, hard drives in Spain and Australia. So we look forward to your coffee. Thank you very much. So um, I'll just basically uh, give you an outline of the presentation. Basically, I'm going to break it into parts. I'm going to respond to the initial um, ambition of the colloquium and just to kind of describe uh, some of the current trends and possibly even speculate on the opportunities that um, digital fabrication may have on the discipline in practice. Which, to be honest, is quite a daunting task, but I'm going to try and do that very quickly, and quite broadly, and not necessarily comprehensively, but broadly. And then I'm going to have a little bit of chat. at least 19 minutes left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I'll try and also then very quickly do a little bit of, a bit of show and tell, because it's always nice to show and tell. Right? So, okay, so the first thing um, I'd like to frame what I'm going to talk about in relation to um, fabrication. And for me, that I guess that means um, trying to think about how digital design and technology is actually can help uh, reframe landscape as a material practice. So um, I would say in many ways, landscape uh, in history and you know, right now has always been a kind of material, explicitly material practice. And it has always been one mediated by technology. So even in the actualization and fabrication, I guess, of landscapes, we've always needed to invent <coughs> technologies to, to kind of help uh, actualize our ambitions in many ways. Uh, the kind of technologies we'll be looking at specifically talking about are basically computational ones, which uh, you know, it's maybe it sounds, sounds as a little bit of a kind of a, a kind of a, a, a irony to be talking about how digital um, media can actually bring us closer to material practice, but in many ways the, the digital realm does actually afford us a kind of level of intelligence with materiality, which you don't really normally ex expect because it's always an assumption there's an abstraction to it that withholds us from, from engaging with materiality. Uh, also, digital, fabric uh, digital fabrication is also something that I'll be talking about. But yes, but uh, you know, I'm trying to show that actually it's super mainstream. So when you know when Jay Leno is on board with it, you know that it's it's, it's a mainstream. Thing. And you know every every kind of every kind of uh, field or industry is looking at it. Everything from aesthetic lens to to printing your own digital food as well. You know, so it's something that's actually generally happening. But I would have to say landscape is something that's a little bit slow on the uptake to, to really engage thinking with it. And I probably it's, I think I, there's a couple of reasons why that is. Um, the other thing I'd like to also do in terms of framing the uh, initial um, talk is also to talk about it in relation to a, a text that I found, which I think was quite a, a good text that explained um, a landscape design and delivery process for a very specific term. But there was also an interesting sidebar in talking about how it influenced pedagogical practices here at the GSD. Um, and I think um, the talk was, uh, the, the um, project they talk about was done in 1984. The talk was given in 2000. I think it's about 12, 20 years difference. And we know now that it's a lifetime. So, so many of the assumptions within the, the, the kind of um, the, the where certain media are best placed um, has evolved a little bit. I said, but a lot of the ambitions are very, very like it, um, legitimate ones and ones that we really need to kind of hang on to. And I do think that somehow digital media has somehow found a way to actually help us engage with a lot of these uh, ambitions. One of them is actually finding moments of um, collaboration, like mediums of collaboration. In this case, this is the example of the sandbox model where basically very fast gestures and very quick collaborations can actually be, be played out. But there's also material intelligence embedded into it. So there's this notion of the angle of repose was already embedded into this, this medium. So that's something that's quite interesting. It's, it's, it's a, that's an ambition for us. The other thing is also how we actually how we can actually deliver the mechanisms or the ways that we fabricate landscapes are also to some extent changing or quite potentially going to change quite soon. So I don't know if spend too much time on this, but Charles has already mentioned that actually the landscape has had a very very long pioneering tradition uh, engaging with the digital realm, uh, particularly with GIS and mapping. Uh, and 
I'm going to show here how some of these things are actually going to be very instrumental in the fabrication side of things possible. And also using digital um, techniques for uh, representational, being able to kind of translate or communicate uh, atmospheres or, or narratives of various kind of ambitions. But I think we'll look specifically at digital. Uh, and one thing I have to also say is that we need to, uh, for me, to talk about the full opportunities, there needs to be a kind of discussion of the relationship between digital uh, modeling, uh, particularly new ones such as associative modeling, and digital fabrication. There needs to be a relationship because in many ways digital fabrication I think is about making things and with a lot of these tools you can make just about anything, I guess. But I guess digital, the modeling process helps mediate and helps channel what we are going to make. Basically. So, um, okay, so basically for me I think one of the reasons why digital uh, landscape has been a little bit slow in the uptake for really embracing digital fabrication is because it's at least what we understand of it is really limited to a scale and scope, which is only a portion of what we're interested in. So typically with architects or other allied um, design disciplines such as uh, industrial design, it's always really about the kind of tectonic or let's say, you know, basically a more tectonic uh, scale. It's this kind of scale that we do engage, but it's only a portion of what we do. The other side of it is really there's a kind of larger territorial or much more, I guess, an almost regional scale engagement with it. And somehow, there hasn't been the, the kind of toys that we can play with. Now, Martin, I'm going to run off a couple of possible toys, and I think maybe, I don't like the arms race for the digital fabrication, but maybe we should buy some of these. The list of toys started already this morning, so it's okay. Go ahead. It's going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Okay, so, um, this, I mean, one, one place where we can look at it, again, we can look at to uh, land up, this is a recent land up project by Rodrigo Dantana, which actually used an autonomous robot to be able to kind of uh, map out old cities, uh, basically uh, South American cities in the desert, uh, it's called the Nazca City. But basically what's quite interesting is the capability to kind of have an autonomous uh, robot actually map out and mark out territories somehow. And I guess that's one thing is about the autonomy, the other thing is also about the kind of the kind of things that you can actually start to map out. The other, the other kinds of robots that are actually, I think in many ways, already shaping landscapes, not directly through our discipline, but through other kinds of industries, are through agriculture, they are now a lot of kind of autonomous or semi-autonomous robots that can do very sophisticated um, uh, agricultural practices, uh, such as uh, different seeding, but at the same time also avoiding cows as well is another thing you can do. And you know, such things as groundkeeping and also the other kinds of agricultural practices are um, now be becoming automated. So in many ways, the way that we actually shape the, the earth or actually also maybe work with um, uh, natural materials is already in some areas been the other kind of area which I think Pierre is very, very, um, you've, you've worked with this obviously before, and what, which I think is quite interesting, is not, not a completely autonomous process, but a kind of GPS assisted process that actually allows grading to become stakeless, so there is no longer that need to kind of uh, have the kind of typical staking uh, process. And it also increases a high degree of precision, and I guess the reason why the extractive industries use it is because it's very efficient. But I think the issue of precision and the ability to um, do many different kinds of uh, interventions, grading interventions, is, is a promise. I think that's something we look at. Now, okay, so other kinds of particular examples where explicitly this kind of, um, uh, um, let's say, engagement with how GPS can actually help us fabricate landscapes is this kind of composition, this kind of composite between kind of hand laying uh, uh, labor and, and being out of GPS in order to be able to kind of lay out a kind of very, very long landscape. It has an intricacy that's beyond beyond what we would normally allow, just simply with hand labor. And then the other thing interesting about this project is also the ability to uh, to combine both the kind of industrial and architectural scale kind of uh, uh, fabrication, digital fabrication, with this larger kind of global or more ge geographic scale type of fabrication. Okay, so I don't know if you believe in UFOs, but if you don't believe in UFOs, then you can also, this, this is also a clear example where GPS is actually something that actually helps us shape um, this. You know, so those who are still... If, if they're made by aliens, they're not landscape. If they're human-made, they're landscape. Well, or the, the, other, the other alternative is maybe UFOs are another possible toy we can buy. <laughs> and, and other kind of mechanisms, you know, these are mechanisms which are not, not digitally fabricated, but they actually emulate uh, some digital uh, processes. This is something that looks like an inkjet printer or, or, or a 3D printer, but it's printing out, not, not failing. You know? So this is something that's, that's, that's happening. And also, obviously, like I said, in the other scale of things, the kind of more industrial 
uh, and more the more tectonic scale and things that landscape has already uh, dived in. There are some exemplary projects that really use the new capabilities afforded with these kind of tools to actually generate certain quite uh, uh, interesting landscape effects. So I think I'm, I'm going to basically maybe try and talk about how. Um, Okay, so let me, let me stop that. So basically, so there is now this big mastery over material that we're afforded with all of these tools. But I guess the other issue is really, okay, so we can make just about anything. So the other issue is like, what should we make? Or what are the kind of issues that, what are the kind of issues we should be looking at when we're deploying these tools? So um, I'm gonna be looking at the relationship now between uh, associative modeling and, and how we can also relate to, to, to these other issues. Now, I, I would like to also talk about it in relation to teaching. So a lot of the uh, examples I'm going to show here are actually examples of uh, projects from students, because I think it's, it's a good example of, uh, typically, you, if you want to see where um, the new trends might emerge, it's kind of good to see when you, when you let students go, go, go on it, and you can actually see what they, what they, how they actually use and abuse the, use it to produce kind of um, promising, um, let's say, promises, I guess, for life. So, okay, so this is, I'm going to depart from the, Kurt Ryder text about um, okay, so this issue of what they learned within practice and actually the modeling, using clay modeling as a way to kind of develop a, a language, a kind of sophisticated language for landform and at the same time um, having embedded within a material intelligence. So this was an interesting medium for them. Uh, for them it was also a very, very good medium for the students to be able to very quickly develop a kind of uh, language, landform language. And I do think that a lot of these things are now being afforded readily accessible within the social modeling. So a lot of the kind of complex topography or surface modeling is something that's actually quite accessible um, for, for us. The other kind of great um, interesting capabilities that are now afforded within associative modeling is the capacity to actually embed material intelligence or behavior within it. So um, in these series of workshops that were conducted here actually, and a lot of students were actually developing different kinds of landscape uh, landforms and infrastructure types but always constructing an associative model that embedded different kinds of material behaviors, such as uh, an overpose or, or other kinds of issues um, into it. And what's quite interesting about it is also quite an interesting collaborative tool because um, um, the sandbox model um, uh, has it embedded within the material logic um, and it's quite easy to move around, but then the algorithm is also quite easy, quite easy to move, move around and share. So the proof of it is the fact that these students, this is the, probably the first time they were ever introduced quite explicitly to these tools and they were able to generate many different kind of responses using the similar algorithm. These were uh, within the course studio. Um, and also looking at topographic conditions. So I'll run through these quite quickly, but you get the sense now, you get the idea of what, what uh, basically the, the kind of similar ambitions that were driven by driving the clay modeling um, workshops also drive some of these kind of you might want to say something more about the clay model workshop and its history in this particular okay. institution, because I mean, given people are from different places, they may not sure. have worked with them. Um, I, I believe it's a, it was a workshop that was um, done for at least a good uh, over a decade, at least here at the GSD, and it was always worked in within the core sequence. I believe. And it was a, it was a way for students to um, basically engage directly with um, um, learning about grading and all these issues, but in a very intuitive way, but having a kind of material. It was originally brought in by George Hunter and then later taught by various other people as well. So these are just some more examples of that. And another series of interesting possible um, things that, um, <coughs> aspects that associated uh, modeling allows us is the ability to kind of bring in this idea of index. So basically this notion of um, formation processes that are influenced by specific uh, parameters. No? So, it also basically it allows us to frame our idea about formation as something that's actually informed by other kinds of things beyond the, the object, the artifact itself. So let's say dynamic forces shaping landscape forms and the various kind of notation systems and actually ways to visualize those dynamic forms are something that are now also becoming not not all of it completely accessible, but now becoming rapidly accessible. So it also you know it allows us to visualize it, but it also gives us a kind of conceptual frame to deal with form. Obviously, uh, Sean was talking about computational fluid dynamics, so it's something that we are in very, very many steps have tried to look at recently, and, and also using that not just to look at how uh, morphology is performative, but how these kind of dynamic processes can also be a way to actually inform how the kind of landscape morphology is going. Um, so, 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 so,
it's all right. It was it was something that was shut up when things were being around. So. <laughs> um, another kind of capability that you get within within this logic is this idea of the index by being able to use it within the kind of digital uh, medium is this idea of adapt adaptability, I guess, to some extent. So uh, I quite like this this image, uh, this kind of image from Vidal Alfonso Sardas. Um, this is what there was once in a kind of speculated period where there was there was an idea that would actually extend the Ensanche over the uh, Montjuic area. And what's quite interesting is this Cartesian, uh, highly efficient grid actually needed to change its, its geometry in order to accommodate that kind of uh, specific landscape features. And I think it's something that's completely embedded already in the way that we actually model landscapes within um, the digital realm. So uh, Steve, Irvin, I guess, in your landscape modeling book is a very, very good example of showing how certain very specific landscape features are things that can get picked up and actually expressed and articulated in the way that we model uh, digitally. So these are, these are in many ways good ways to map things, but they're also good ways to actually start considering how we might intervene, you know, how we might actually work <coughs> with the landscape, how we might actually find ways, uh, find kind of parameters and ways to actually uh, distribute or organize grounds. So these are, a lot of these are abstract exercises, but they, they kind of try to point towards this, this notion of being specific to the topography in many ways. Um, other kinds of things that we might, might map or, or might be able to script quite easily nowadays are various other behaviors, uh, such as for watershed, by the way, I'll we'll be very quick now. So basically, these are some examples of that. So the adaptability is all very explicit here. <laughs> 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 We just ate. So. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, there's there's a series of other kind of possibilities. So if we move back down to the tectonic scale, that's that's something that the architects have already looked at quite explicitly. But I think we can bring other kinds of sensibilities to it. And obviously, it's quite it's quite clear that a lot of these digital uh, design tools and fabrication tools also bring with it a sensibility. So I, I don't think we can talk about it purely about performance. But we have to acknowledge that there are some material sensibilities that emerge out. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, would this have happened without Photoshop and would this have happened without the software? I don't know. <laughs> um, so, a lot of the students are, are given, uh, within some of these courses, are uh, given free will to develop uh, kind of sensibility and material, say, so yeah, material sensibility out of engagement with these tools. These are some examples of how some of them might actually translate that into actual fabrication exercises. And actually, what's quite interesting, it also becomes a very hard lesson in geometry as well. So there are some things that you can model, but there are some things that really you have to be very specific about geometrically, but otherwise you require different kinds of tools. And that's something that I think is a very good didactic process for, for, for designers in general. So I'll, I'll just race through this very quickly. Uh, these are some interesting exercises of actually working with material, basically working with digital fabrication to kind of create certain material effects. And this is a kind of an interesting project where you can actually model physical forces. Um, in this case, they've developed a kind of pneumatic um, uh, form mode system to create these kind of platforms. This is probably the biggest thing I've ever had <coughs> produced in, in, at the course and probably the shortest lasting one. I'll show you why, because actually this became form mode for a, a kind of ice man. <laughs> And it was only, I think, because of the winter we had this year, it was only in the quadrant for about two days. <laughs> I mean, it's a landform condition, but obviously there's this interiority that, that became quite interesting. Okay, so I'm going to, is it okay if I just do a bit of, okay, I'll be very quick. So these are these are projects that were done, um, led by myself and Maria Asensio, and also working together with students here at the GSD. I'm involving them in the process of this is like an essential uh, part of the GSD collaboration. And also working, collaborating a completely multidisciplinary kind of project. We're working together with engineers and also working with um, uh, biologists, uh, Suzanne Van Gogh, to think it's um, um, MOS, the MOS project. Well, basically, we were given a very kind of site specific uh, brief. So we were given a kind of garden uh, that had to be kind of online, direct online, with kind of access of entry. <coughs> and this is in Matisse in Quebec. and. Um, we had to do something that actually gestured a kind of um, the kind of entrance sequence, I guess, in many ways. So this this kind of logic was something that actually really could really kind of um, uh, exploit the kind of continuous variation logic that you find in digital fabrication, and also at the same time this kind of this kind of differential logic. 
the other thing though is we had, had to think about it not in the kind of very kind of in situ type of construction logic that you talk, typically associate with landscape, but within the limits of limits of these kind of fabrication <coughs> things we're talking about, it had to be a kind of prefabricated model. And we thought in these two different workforces in this case, there was us building it downstairs, and then there's the, the kind of volunteer workforce that's over there who are very low skill. So we thought that it would be kind of logical to kind of develop a logic where um, uh, the way that it would be assembled would be akin to a kind of uh, IKEA model of difficulty, I guess. Uh, so that basically meant that we had to find this kind of, we had to find a, a relationship between a very site-specific requirement and at the same time trying to be kind of, uh, to, some, to some extent, prototypical. So we kind of developed a logic for it. And actually, in many ways, a lot of the digital tools actually help doing that. So being able to model the site, being able to kind of create these things, but at the same time, you know, finding ways to kind of template this and then ship it on site. So two weeks before we arrived on site, they were able to kind of put this in the right place and cast it in, in a concrete base. So a lot of these things were quite helpful, but it's kind of, it was a tension. I guess it's a tension that I, I'm not saying is resolved, but I think it's something that's also worth thinking about. It's kind of uh, site specificity versus a kind of more off-site kind of logic that you would have with these tools. So these are some images of students working on it. We also kind of did the trouble of actually doing a kind of mock-up of it and uh, downstairs in the rolling bay. And what was quite interesting about the form is it had this kind of specific issue of gesturing and entrance way, but what was quite interesting when we was work developing it together with the biologist was this notion of um, this orientation actually produces many different microclimates in, in itself. So basically, it's, the form is kind of nice, it does this gesture, but what's quite interesting about it is it was actually the opportunity for us to actually curate different species of moss along that surface. So basically, the orientation would be creating different microclimates, and as a result of that, you actually embed different kind of moss uh, species within so this kind of relationship, the kind of thermodynamic performance of form was something that we kind of looked at as kind of interesting. And the way that form actually creates microclimates as well. So these are some examples of the, of the finished piece. And a lot of unexpected kind of um, ways that people have commented. We, we, we didn't think, we thought, oh my god, yes, of course there are steps, but we didn't know that. This is some examples of it and different skins of landscaping. So, uh, this is where we would have been nice to have one of those robots. So we had to wait quite a few days for this retired uh, guy who was really an artist on these things to come out, otherwise, we couldn't have done it. They were saying, How are we going to make this map? And they said, Yeah, here's a break. <laughs> so, we, had to, we would have been nice to have one of those. Um, looking, looking at the micro scale, so there's two scales, I guess, more, many different scales in which the garden operates. The other scale is also this kind of micro of moss uh, embedded in the wall, moss guy in the wall. It was quite interesting with that too. Basically, it really draws you in at some at one scale, and then it can be prominent at another scale. But um, this is something that um, this one I had to admit was a bit of a post rationalization. When we looked at this, uh, the biologist said, "But well, this is great. It kind of shaded at a micro level, and also when you water it, it kind of retains the water." Okay, I mean I can believe that. It's, but she said it, so but, you know, it's, somehow it's kind of an interesting micro level. Uh, and it, again, basically inspired by um, the micro. <coughs> Structure of moss, and then okay. Now, so this is a this is a, this is a creation. I'm going to finish this one very quickly. So they told us, is it okay? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this one basically, okay. they, they, they the Reffitt Gardens were invited to Canada Blooms, which is a kind of big garden show, and it's an interior. It's inside a big box, and they basically said, okay, we've got to. Uh, they want something along the same lines. So we thought, okay, let's let's actually really play up this this issue of. of Prefabricated element, but the prefabricated element that can actually uh, produce specificity to some extent. But we wanted to kind of do something that in many ways could be cheap and easy. It wouldn't be out of place sitting on an IKEA shelf, like almost like a planter box. Because for us, the kind of way in which they, these kind of garden shelves actually operate is very kind of strange. I mean, basically, they try and replicate landscapes there on the outside, inside a big box. They do these huge trees, and they make like these huge trees which stay up for five days and then they would chip them. It's bizarre, and they basically they try and make things that look like the outdoor, outdoor barbecue. So for us, basically, we work with a prefabricated, prefabricated model, and we also work this notion, this notion of a planter box that actually, because of its relationship between one and the other, and angle rotation, can produce different scales of, of gardens. So in this case, embedded within the wall, like before, and also starting to produce different um, uh, pockets, like let's say garden pockets. Now in this case.
scale, also depending on the angle of rotation, you produce many different scales of that as well. Uh, again, we've tried to do this some mock-ups downstairs, and this is the kind of easy idea of assembling on site. And also, it, using this kind of uh, prefabricated moss that we just drop into the system. And these are some of the qualities and uh, kind of qualities of the It was a very quick, fast, and easy project, but for us, it was kind of an exercise of not doing the differential, kind of the um, continuous differentiation, but what if we kind of use the same unit and kind of differentiate how we might relate one to the other. Yeah, the different scales of engagement. So basically, micro scale with MOS, and also you know, mid scales. Okay, so these are just some quick example images. And then I'll just end on the last point. The last point is um, we, we looked again at this, and then I think we, there's an opportunity for us now to basically um, install this in an, in, an, in an outdoor setting. So that actually the thermodynamic performance becomes important now. And it also, because of the rotation, produces many different scales. It's something we're going to look at, I think. And what would be quite interesting is this, if you look at the thermodynamic performance, it's quite explicit. Depending on the scale and the speed of rotation, it actually produces many different microclimates, uh, both on the surface and also within the pocket. So actually, depending on the scale and the speed of rotation, you've got either very, very shaded and and this is something that I think um, we're going to look at. And that's basically <coughs> Thank you very much, David. So while we're switching position here, I'll introduce the next uh, speakers. We have the Keith Fenders and Karen McCloskey, who are getting into the driver's seat there. They're both uh, currently teaching at the University of Pennsylvania and um, are co-founders of the practice PEG, Office of Landscape and Architecture, a practice based in Philadelphia that explores the potential for new media and fabrication technologies to produce novel relationships between organic and inorganic materials. I think in your, in your talk you're also going to show that this is um, so the theme that you're pursuing very much through an interest in patterns, we look forward to that. The firm has been quite successful, has won many awards, uh, among them the Emerging New York Architects Prize, the AIA Award, ID Magazine Award. Uh, you have featured a number of uh, publications. You also got a BSA research grant. Um, and um, I mentioned you both teaching at Penn. Uh, Karen has a background in architecture from SIAR and actually graduated uh, from this landscape program, uh, the GST, in 99. Keith uh, did his Bachelor of Architecture at the University of Detroit and then did a Master of Art in an area called Critical Studies in Architectural Culture from, from uh, UCL, UCLA. I look forward to your talk. Are you ready? Sorry, yeah, we just, I think so. Uh, okay. <coughs> thank you for coming. Okay. Okay, good. All right, thank you so much. Um, we will stay within our lot of 20 minutes, even though we're two, and we will not finish each other's sentences. We promise. Um, so we're going to look at projects today that fit into a current topic that we're working on, um, a book called The Science of Life, that looks at the relevance and efficacy of pattern in contemporary landscape architecture. And this topic fits the notion of fabricated landscapes in two ways. First, uh, directly in terms of digital fabrication of component parts or materials, and projects under um, that category are patterns modulation. But secondly, more broadly, um, we're interested in fabricated in terms of the constructed and manufactured nature of landscapes today. Those projects will fit under pattern as figuration. Landscapes are a synthesis, of course, of natural and engineered systems. And especially in the urban sites we work today in our post-industrial landscapes, um, they have to be almost literally rebuilt from the ground up in order to support new uses and new habitats. And this should liberate us from any preconceived notions of, of naturalistic looking landscapes um, or uh, conventional ideas about the sustainability mandates placed on landscapes today. So our interest in pattern stems from a desire to bind together the ecological and digital in ways that emphasize the visual and experiential aspects of landscape as much as its environmental or technical aspects. Um, and just so you know what we're talking about in our title, we're interested in the notion of fitness, um, which refers to Ian McCarr, um, and flatness, which refers to Pete Walker. And those are two notable figures who dealt with pattern in very different ways 
and are said to characterize the great divide in landscape architecture that characterized the discipline in the 70s and 80s. Um, so even though many practices have since melded this divide, they've not necessarily done so in ways that try to bring together um, uh, this notion of pattern um, and that new media can facilitate thinking about um, the two versions of pattern that they represent. So some people have already mentioned um, Ian McCard in the overlay method, um, which was a precursor to GIS. So this is pattern finding and analysis. Um, whereas Walker very much focused on um, applying patterns using the elements, um, distinct elements in landscape and layering them to highlight the structuring elements of the design landscape. Um, so the question for us is how can fitness, and we're not going to talk about fitness in terms of large scale planning, but fitness today has very much to do with the sustainability mandates placed on landscapes, water collection, constructed wetlands, etc. So how can that notion of um, fitness be organized in ways that follow Peter Walker's belief that if the landscape is not visible or expressive, it's drained of its ability to be resident. <clears throat> so the ecological and digital um, share relational thinking, of course, such as systems and parametrics, and patterns are something that are relevant and endemic to both. Um, so the pervasive theoretical shift in how we understand and represent the dynamics of living processes has to be seen in the context of the informational age. Um, and of course, the ability for computers to model increasing amounts of information and has given us a way to understand and represent complex systems in a way that we didn't have the ability before. So the eco-digital coupling has influenced design in such a multitude of ways that it's often difficult to untangle the divergent ideologies at play when invoking design in the name of ecology. So for some, it maintains its conventional understanding, referring to ecosystem health, and biodiversity. Um, for others, like the examples you see on the screen, um, it's uh, used to generate novel form and has led to wide-ranging expressions um, such as biomorphology, topology, emergent form. Uh, within landscape architecture, the dynamics of living processes has had a somewhat different manifestation, and the use of digital tools has been less about innovating form organization and structure and more about representing the temporal aspects of landscape, such as changes in the landscape's composition that you see in the diagrams here, um, otherwise known as ecological succession. Um, and so digital techniques have remained largely within the realm of mapping extant patterns, so following the carving new developments in GIS, or in the service of representing emergent patterns via richly textured diagrams and Photoshop images or phasing drawings. So even though the the uh, representative self-organization has been important. It deals with temporal scales that are not uh, perceptible. And so we're interested in how patterns can uh, guide and convey processes where the result and pattern are legible um, because of their coherent structure, which is based on uh, repetition and recurrence in both formal and temporal ways. Um, pattern has somewhat of a bad rap in landscape architecture um, <laughs> because of their association with flatness uh, uniformity, they're static in their material, and therefore they don't represent contemporary understandings of, of nature and natural process. Um, but even though patterns can be made um, by applying preconceived <coughs> geometries, um, they can also be produced by structuring, structuring the relationship among components, among or between components. Um, and Hans Jenny, um, author of Synatics, who in the 60s and 70s was looking at wave phenomena has produced some of the more arresting examples of how a fluctuating field of uh, forces can produce periodic and aperiodic patterns. So that rather than shaping, um, rather than making patterns through direct, direct manipulation of material, um, each pattern is made from a vibration, in this case the image there is sand, um, through the modulation of tone and frequency. So these, these ornate patterns emerge from the vibration. Um, <clears throat> so, Taking inspiration from these experiments where patterns are created by structuring relationships, um, programs such as there would be new software like um, Rhino, paneling tools, Grasshopper, etc., give the capacity to visualize forces um, as points of inflection in order to generate dynamic patterns. So we'll show a couple projects first that um, use this idea uh, of modulating surface by varying components in order to produce non-uniform patterns. Um, 
we have to run through these really quickly, so we're not going to give you any background <laughs> information. But um, this is a very simple I, um, project that explains that idea, um, which we did with Ply Architecture. And this was custom fabricating concrete tiles to make an elevated plinth surface. And I'll just say that it's um, in a shopping plaza adjacent to Nice's Seminole Lockett Park project in Detroit, and the plaza sits on axis with one of his towers in the background. So we were playing off of Nice's signature elements of the plinth. Um, the grid and the book ash slabs of stone. Okay. Um, so the surface is basically uh, composed of concrete tiles on a four foot module, which you see in the drawings on the right. Um, and we created five molds. We did this CNC milling for the molds. We created five molds and their mirrored counterparts, again, playing off this, the way we used to cut stone patterns symmetrically across their joints. Um, and the molds create, uh, were used to cast the 192 tiles that make up the surface of the plaza. And because each tile has two variations, one in its x-axis, which you see here, a short edge, and one in its z-axis, oops, here, which creates, sorry, I keep pointing your head, but, which <laughs> creates a shallow edge. Um, Late in the house, Phil. <laughs> um, so those two vari morphological variations um, create an indeterminate pattern of openings. In other words, these could be um, cobbled together in many different ways um, to produce the, the final figures that you see in the bottom drawing, um, which just uh, show the low points, which are planted um, openings. So the inflection in the z-axis directs water into these planted openings. Um, and you can see here, planted uh, with drought-tolerant vegetation, so it doesn't need to be irrigated once established. Okay, um, so we're going to uh, continue the theme of modulation uh, in a couple of projects that we've been doing in Bacon Moss in Philadelphia. Uh, and, the, and the two uh, deal with this idea of uh, modulation differently, the one kind of modulating water infiltration and the other one plant growth. Um, and both of which uh, are dealing with the customization of conventional engineering substrates, uh, which are common to most. Uh, public landscapes today and large infrastructures in the range of geotextiles, uh, geocells, and basically the, the manufacturing and support of soil. Um, and what uh, Andrea talked earlier about uh, the vast number of vacant lots that we have in Philadelphia, upwards of 40,000 lots. And, and given these kind of sustainability mandates that are really starting to press uh, on a lot of uh, cities, given the EPA's uh, water quality uh, mandates, uh, there's been a real push towards the green infrastructure. And so they're starting to actually expand the idea of uh, investing a ton of money into hard infrastructure and starting to look at more soft infrastructures. And through that, they've uh, looked at the opportunity of, of starting to enhance the uh, filtration capabilities of the vacant lots. Uh, in thinking about them in aggregate form rather than a totally unified plan. So the way we've approached uh, this project is under the guise of kind of in incremental infrastructures in the sense that these kind of smaller installations can aggregate to bigger effects. Uh, and uh, like most professors and teachers, uh, we exploit the condition in which we uh, exist. So how do we use our daily lives uh, to the benefits <laughs> and ends uh, of the research. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to teach a digital fabrication uh, to media classes at the University of Pennsylvania. One is a digital fabrication seminar. And the, the kind of topic we've been taking up in the <clears throat> last couple of years has been an idea of thinking about uh, this idea of kind of soft accelerators and retardants. So given that we have an understanding that uh, landscapes are constituted by processes, always uh, impacted by flows and dynamics. Uh, so you think about <clears throat> how we can uh, actually control or modulate uh, the material that moves through those landscapes by either speeding it up or slowing it down. So, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. Uh, you can see the uh, example of the work looking at uh, non-uniform aggregation studies and these topographic studies. Uh, and then also ideas of non-uniform componentry and thinking about a range of uh, effects and techniques that that might have. Um, and then 
this is the old one. This is out of place. That's the completed GeoCell project that we just finished. It's pretty. Um, wanting to explain a bit about the process first. Um, so given the, <clears throat> the work that we were able to generate in the, the seminar, uh, we uh, were fortunate enough to get a hold of some vacant land. It's actually a lot more difficult than one would expect. Um, there are a lot of uh, legal issues. Um, and so we uh, developed this a series of parametric definitions. Uh, we have two adjacent water sources in this site. One coming off the roof of the building, and one from the parking lot. Uh, a series of parametric visualizations. So think about uh, the flow of water. We map the existing flow uh, and the patterns that they generated, and then uh, basically the reconfiguration of those patterns uh, to set up uh, collection basins and kind of enhance the capability of infiltration. Uh, those patterns, which you can see under various, various states of inundation, is kind of there's actually one other here, so it's low, medium, and high. Uh, those those uh, density patterns were used to kind of generate a, a series of spacing parameters that set up the cell dimensions in relationship to the input volumes of water. So that kind of extracted parameter then uh, actually works into the performance of the geo cell. And there's a kind of expression of that in this direct milk plaster model. Um, we also looked at how we could kind of update, revise, or enhance the traditional geo cell. We went through, in the digital fabrication seminar, as I said, a series of alternatives. Um, we actually ended up uh, prototyping and testing basically a double uh, wall configuration. And so, unlike a traditional geo cell, which is a single cell, they're all uniform, they're completely standardized, we could actually develop uh, through the parametric model, uh, kind of customize some profile and size, but we could also control through the double wall uh, the percentages of grass and gravel in relationship to the input of water volume. Okay, here's uh, just a composite slide. This is vacant lot uh, after it was excavated, uh, the starting of the installation. Uh, basically, filled it in quickly with uh, grass. Or sorry, with gravel and dirt, and then seeded it, and then you can see the completed trench here, which uh, there's a large uh, collection basin underneath, and we've been moderately, we, uh, we just finished it uh, over the summer, and we've been moderately monitoring uh, the water collection rates and keeping track of those. Um, oh, okay. Um, so the next one. Uh, where we were looking at geocells and their customization for water infiltration. We, on this one, we were actually looking at geotextiles, which are very common, um, both in uh, uh, residential landscapes, off-the-shelf material. Uh, we were looking at a, basically a kind of low-cost, low-maintenance strategy for the kind of upkeep and uh, visibility of vacant lots, because the the issue of visibility and the aesthetics of care in vacant lots is extremely important in relationship uh, to the issues of health and um, a kind of public benefit. Um, so here we started off with the traditional knot garden uh, with a kind of intricate uh, overlapping geometry. Uh, from there, we developed a series of evenly spaced circles that we varied in size and in width. Uh, the smallest in width is 1 inch, the largest in width is 12 inches. So the idea there was to test the resolution uh, and resiliency of the, the, the width of the cut. Uh, we had a 400 square foot uh, vacant lot. Uh, we cut it into two parts to test the how it would actually modulate and control that plant growth. In the one test plot, we totally removed the existing vegetation, uh, and we, we put down new soil. In the uh, one in the foreground, we just surface cut the existing vegetation. We laid down the geotextile, covered it with gravel, <coughs> seeded it, and then you can see this is the completed test plot. Uh, you can see that the in the foreground, uh, initially, it held the pattern of the existing vegetation. 
held the uh, the pen. I thought it was time. Um, <laughs> it is time. Okay, it held the existing pattern, but then it decayed really uh, quickly because of creeping vegetation. Yeah. Sorry, don't Sorry. Have time to we don't have time for that. You get two extra minutes. It's going to be fair. Oh, yeah. um, we, I think we're going to still use that up. Okay, and then the this part. Uh, we're in a new category. So that new category is the topic of figuration. Here, pattern uh, is used as a means to convey processes, both in terms of material flows and display. Uh, we look to someone like systems ecologist Howard T. Odom, for instance, who describes pattern as the form or structure of connections within a system's flow. Uh, being both a form, uh, form of transportation and transmission pattern uh, is then an index in which material and information are organized. Uh, this is for a uh, competition in Taichung, Taiwan, 68 hectare park. Uh, was, we uh, actually started out by, I have to do this very quickly, uh, kind of mapping out the extent patterns of pollution in relationship uh, uh, data called from uh, the, uh, what is it, it's an Android app and then took the water volume, and with that we generated a series of uh, responses in which to kind of ameliorate and buffer the interior of the park, um, which generated those kind of circles. Uh, and then with that model we were also able to generate an underlying grid system, which we could basically, uh, through that, trace a self-similar branching geometry. Uh, we used that as a distribution system along the length of the park, um, that could actually then respond in scale and deformation to adjacencies and connectivity uh, in the surrounding context. Uh, though, uh, this is an important point, though it may be uh, uh, uniform in plan, uh, it's radically different in our, in, through our models uh, in, in material and uh, in section. And then some uh, different states of inundation those circles were meant to kind of receive all of the volatility that's uh, endemic to the Taichung area. Okay, sorry, we're rushing. Oh, so lastly, just a few slides from a studio I did at Penn um, in Las Vegas, which it also uses figuration, but it's in a more ornamental form, um, to exploit the dual nature of Vegas as both desert and spectacle. Um, ornament is often considered a subset of pattern, um, and it, it also traditionally references an idea about nature and natural process, so what is that um, in today's environmental context? Um, we began with uh, two-dimensional models of aggregating unit and then transformed them into three dimension to study the potential for these modules to create topography. And a lot of this is to push back um, on how we often assign program and function to landscape architecture. So instead you create this, this new kind of topography and then ask what kind of conditions might this produce. Um, we worked uh, topographically, also in terms of uh, vertical structures, wall structures. And then the second step was to look at the morphology of the region by diagramming three kinds of forces, seismic, wind, and water. This is just one drawing, one example. Um, in terms of actions, transformation, and resultant <coughs> form. And these studies were the basis for de developing figures that could transform and scale and be responsive to site parameters, such as site access. Um, so just very quickly, this one project I'll show you, utilized a series of operations um, inspired by the structural principles found in desert plants, the Fibonacci sequence found in, in succulents and cacti, and used that um, to structure the topography of the, the site. Um, so he generated an overall um, topography, sorry, okay, um, out of this arabesque form um, that is assigned an undulating surface. Um, here, and it basically, as it cuts low, it gets near groundwater, but also creates a continually shifting position as one moves clockwise and counterclockwise along its paths. And then, what, and then onto that pattern is mapped the second pattern, which is a gradient of mounds and depressions. Um, and those are uh, juxtaposed with extremes of wet, dry, concave, convex, um, and high and low, just creating microclimates in the, in the landscape. Um, and then the third uh, set of spirals was overlaid and mirrored on the first, and this was used to distribute a series of what the student called solar spikes, which collect energy during the day. Um, 
This is just showing the CNC milled model of the topography, um, how it works in section. The field of solar spikes are distributed um, and overlaid on the other two patterns, um, which creates a spectacle of light at night. And so the solar field um, and arabesque form are boldly ornamental in keeping with Vegas and a touristic understanding of Vegas, but they're used to frame a more delicate interior habitat that really speaks to the regional context of Vegas. Um, and so Simon Bell, yeah, Simon Bell, sorry, I forgot one minute. Simon Bell, um, uh, aptly called, who's a landscape architect and forester, said um, patterns are the diagrams of process, and we think that's a really good definition because it's, uh, it is um, a representation of nature without looking like a naturalistic view of nature that we've come to expect of our landscapes. Um, so just to conclude, um, the, the projects we showed today are trying to conjoin um, landscapes, utilitarian and aesthetic functions by absorbing the functional mandates placed on landscapes without forsaking uh, formal and conceptual coherency. Thank you very much. Thank you. aspects in both of those uh, body of works are very productively intertwined. So I'll let the peer take the lead. Thanks very much, Martin. And uh, thanks very much, David. Uh, we can. Um, I, I think the presentations that you've provided um, give us a, a good array of an understanding fundamentally of a breakdown between the, the conventional or formal categories of the digital and the ecological. I think for me this is um, uh, it's a very uh, a basic observation, but I think it's a, an extremely important one because I think in an institutional environments um, we have a tendency of dissociating them, and what we're gradually seeing at least within the um, within the field of landscape architecture is the gradual um, convergence of them. And in many respects, there is a, a huge spectrum, a horizon that's opening in relationship to, to that practice, um, which allows architects to work with landscape architects, which, which also allows us to work with, with engineers um, and agronomists, I think, as well, and plant experts. And in many respects, there is, a, you know, there, there is a, a way in which you're approaching it on, on two levels, where there is the use of um, of, of modeling not necessarily uniquely through a, a final or end game representation, but modeling as a form of, uh, in many respects, of, of modulation, um, and also at the same time, a, a form of, of, uh, of molding. So there's, there's both a, a method of representation, a method of fabrication, and also a method of testing. And, and there's also um, uh, the, the matter on another level, uh, which is, uh, experiential, which deals with the perception of patterns through prototyping itself as well. So in, in many respects, if we can see this, this spectrum of the digital and the ecological as spanning, let's say, the, all the way from the experiential um, to, the, uh, to the, the, the performative or the active, all the way to potentially, as you mentioned, the, the territorial and the geographic, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask in terms of your own practices in terms of where you see that happening. But I'd just like to, perhaps for, for also for our, for our audience, perhaps place the practices that you're involved in, um, in terms of combining design, fabrication, uh, implementation, uh, also the social nature of implementation, clearly as part of your work, um, that it, it starts to break down this, this ideology that, um, that designers are, are, are simply drafts, draftsmen people that we only produce drawings and, and second that um, that there is this somewhat contractual obligation on the, on the part of designers um, that depend on certain types of specializations and contractual obligations with clients so there's a somewhat of a breakdown of those relationships and I find it interesting that it's in many respects it's prototyping both digital and analog that allows that to happen 
and, and you know, if we if we go back even a hundred years ago, that, um, you know, the, the gardener Joseph Monnier, who who in fact invented uh, uh, steel reinforced concrete um, through through bridges and, and pots and planters, when there was a material revolution that was occurring at the beginning of the 20th century, and in many respects, what your work is also leading to is that there's a, uh, another material revolution happening with not necessarily the, the creation of, well, there's the creation of new materials, yes, but there's also um, an engagement of, for example, very basic materials like aggregates, um, soils, um, an inversion of the use of drainage and infiltration as intrinsic as part of the projects. And, and in many respects, it's, 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 it's not a coincidence either that aggregates and soils form a distinctively new category today beyond uh, solids, liquids, and gases. And so there's almost like a coming to terms with, with all these changes that are occurring. And so my question uh, for, for both, for, for all of you is, in terms of where this is going, in terms of how to be able to unlock um, a number of different practices today beyond, let's say, um, the, the design boutique offices and the, the large corporate offices, prototyping itself for you seems to be central in, in the work that you're doing on a number of different levels, intellectual very practical ones, as well as economic ones. And, and I'd like your opinion on, on that. And, and then second, um, <laughs> um, and, then, and then second, can you speak um, uh, in terms of the, the use of modeling, which is intrinsic as part of your work, which is not necessarily uh, uh, an end game, but it's an iterative process as part of your practices, how perhaps we're, we're beginning to see a more performative role of models in terms of testing um, as opposed to just in, in the visualization. Because in many respects, what I'm, what I'm struck by in terms of bringing back to the, the notion of the breakdown between the digital and the ecological is that there's somewhat of a subversion of the notion of the aesthetic affiliation of design with the production of models, and then all of a sudden there is somewhat of a, a bionic approach to fabrication and design. And, and so that's something that, that seems striking as part of your practices in Earth. Oh, I can speak to the first question you asked about the um, model of practice, or at least um, for our projects, the the ones we showed um, on the vacant sites in Philadelphia, those are self-initiated and funded with grants. Um, uh, that we, a whole Boston site of architects was one of them, um, and also Munich University Research Foundation. Um, and those are really trying to, because vacancy is such a huge issue in Philadelphia, um, you know, we thought, what are other ways to, they cannot possibly pay for uh, maintaining all these sites. They're not going to be re-inhabited, and it's really unrealistic. Um, so looking at strategies of low cost, really easy to install, uh, low maintenance, was what got us interested in thinking about how you could laser cut the weed control barrier. You never see weed control barrier, but it's a big risk in the landscape. And just the idea of growing the patterns, um, you know, helps create a, what looks to be a, a care for surface, um, which matters a lot in these contexts. Now, to put it in the, the social context, we, uh, we were working with uh, local, we found local groups who we could sort of latch on to in terms of helping us find sites most appropriate to test this particular work. Um, they're uh, sitting like adjacent next to community gardens or are owned by nonprofit organizations uh, or are maintained by them. Um, for the stormwater infiltration trench, we were working with uh, Philadelphia Water Department, Pennsylvania Horticulture Society, who does a lot of clearing of vacant sites. Um, so the point is that we, um, you know, we came with an I idea and a technique, and that we have to work with them to facilitate where is the best and most appropriate uh, place to install these as as one of many potential ways to deal with vacancy in a low cost. I guess the only thing I would add to that is that uh, you know, each of those organizations that we basically organize them, uh, in, they, they, they operate separately with their own self-interest towards vacancy. The Pennsylvania uh, Horticultural Society, the Philadelphia Water Department, the way they look at vacancy is really limited. But uh, in the project we were at, 
you know, bringing these partners together to set up a synthetic mandate where they could actually start to talk and integrate more and, and share the information. But I think more importantly, and what you're pointing out here, is the idea that design isn't necessarily a kind of passive condition and purely service-oriented, where we sit around and wait for clients to uh, be gathered money upon us to, so that we can fill out our visions. We wouldn't mind that. No? Well, we wouldn't, yeah, well, we absolutely wouldn't mind that. But, but, it, but that it can be actually active and generative um, and can actually restructure the relationships that are uh, going on organizationally and that it administer and oversee uh, a lot of land uh, in the city. So I, I think um, what's quite interesting, particularly amongst this adoption of associated um, online techniques, is because there is that there is always a requirement for a meaningful tourist user parameters to drive the mission process. Okay. So it's already giving you a kind of frame of reference, a conceptual frame that forces you to think about organizations of norms in relation to various people's parameters, which is a, a little bit different from the kind of authorial. I think it's a really important question given the fact that uh, there was just, I guess it was in 2010 where um, uh, the, I guess the workshopping uh, exposition of the U.S. architects and designers the DNL represented the new model of practice and in, in many respects it, it wasn't, what was interesting is that it wasn't necessarily contingent uh, exclusively on, on visual methods but uh, the enabling possibilities of Technologies. I think Ben Randa would have been there a few years ago as well. Um, I think we can open this up to uh, questions from our audience. Can I just push, push it along a little, a little bit more? Um, David, I, I was interested in your invocation of the clay model. I mean, that was the, the most, um, the most uh, extensive I've heard you on that. And it is true, I mean, in this particular institution, there was that moment where the indexing of fluvial geomorphology, among other things, became quite instrumental. And at the same moment, there was a, both a pedagogic argument behind it, there was also a set of practices out there. Um, and it was deployable at the scale that you showed in some of those projects. And the, the facile critique that developed relatively quickly was that, well, what kinds of performative claims can we make about that, those surfaces? And my reception of that work was largely that, well, we're indexing very dynamic processes and we're arresting them for a phenomenological experience. Right? Each of you uh, in your presentations did a, a, an extraordinarily good job of filling out this category for us. I particularly appreciate the way in which each of you in different ways spoke to um, where the, this body of work has come from and where you see it going. But in, in certain ways, in both presentations, there were moments when the um, I don't know if it's the parameters of fabrication or the logics of, of uh, morphology. Um, somehow, to put it you know, crudely, pattern making got out ahead of performativity, if I could put it that way. And then each of you then could come back very quickly and, and kind of, I think maybe retroactively, correct me if I'm wrong, apply um, kind of performative measures and models to those patterns. And not surprisingly, each of them then revealed certain divergent performative possibilities. But the performative, if I'm correcting in reading both of you this way, is kind of la a lagging indicator. That is, the performative comes after vis-a-vis -vis the form making. And uh, first of all, I wonder if that, do I have that reading correct? Is that fair? And second of all, are there ways in which the more um, the more uh, performative dimensions could actually play a more instrumental or operative role? Um, I guess the answer is that it's not always. Um, it's not always. A Sometimes um, a kind of range of projects that were shown in the presentations, they were different instances where it was a driver. And then at the 
other scales, maybe, you know, a lot of these projects had multiple scales as well, but other scales maybe they were not, maybe there was a kind of like a default language that was a little bit And then you, you, you find a performance for it. But actually, that, that kind of logic of sometimes working that way, that you're actually working with a particular, that you're, you have an intuition, and then you find that, you know, it's actually the way that a lot of material science scientists and material researchers actually work. So, I mean, just, you know, we, we sometimes talk to some of the people across the road, you know, and we're quite surprised that actually most of it is not really a very linear process. Quite often it's really them just throwing out various kind of tests and they find a kind of performance activity out of it sometimes. So I do think sometimes the design process, you know, sometimes it's really quite linear and a little bit very kind of like very specifically driven by performance, but sometimes you do have intuitions and then it produces. And I do think that that's part of the design process. You can't always have all the answers sort of pretty, I think that's my opinion. Um, did you want to do that? Yeah. Uh, maybe not necessarily about that, but uh, obviously, uh, given the shortness of the presentation, these are you know kind of radically truncated, uh, especially some of the work that kind of in initiates the, the pattern making um, does come out of, and that's I think our interest in this idea of kind of thickness and flatness that one doesn't necessarily perceive the other and that they, they kind of mutually inform and start to feed back through one another so that we can start to measure uh, certain assumptions that we're making about performance and how that, that performance also has a social function, right? Because the, the performance is to our benefit in some way. Um, and then how that feeds back uh, to the other side of it. Um, and in the, some of the, the uh, examples I didn't show is that uh, you know there's a really kind of intensive kind of pattern finding that, that a la the Macar method is that you don't make these kind of superficial visual assumptions, but it's how you actually draw that terrain uh, that actually starts to suggest how we respond to it, and then how we start to intervene. We have to understand the kind of the, uh, actually the changes that are made by that, uh, start to register, evaluate them, work through a series of, especially through associative modeling, uh, not necessarily an answer, but a series of answers, and start to measure uh, those, uh, not uh, necessarily, you know, uh, this is a, a fixed condition, but maybe there are a series of probabilities with the ranges to it. And, and then there's gonna, in sometimes a, and next scale, looking at the, the actual pattern generation and at the scale of the component, and then how that feeds back to larger performance and kind of back and forth. And, and I would say that my studio in Las Vegas was explicitly against how the notion of performance and emergence has overtaken any sort of functionalism in that sort of architecture. So it was absolutely about starting with a module that could where you could invent a topography that didn't come from indexing process, um, and actually then create this new thing and ask, okay, what processes does that guide or direct, and have you created new kinds of microclimates or things? So it was, it was actually working in the opposite um, to challenge how we assign function and performativity, with the presumption being that aesthetics is performative as well. And the reason we're interested in the topic of pattern is because um, it's, it is a, an index of these natural systems. We can see them in nature everywhere all, at all scales, but they're also things that we can recognize and see uh, perceptually. So it binds together these oppositional categories that still tend to play discussions like performance and representation and matter and sign. Let's see if there's more questions from your eyes. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I think time's up. <laughs> Grace period. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, now my question is, I think it's a follow-up question on Charlie, what you just mentioned in terms of the pattern. Um, because I like this when you mentioned it, the pattern as being a result of a process and ideally a natural process, right? So I would say, great. But then if I look at this, frankly, and I'm, you know, if I look at the work then, then I'm getting a little frustrated just simply because it seems a rather the design decision from you that is defining the pattern. And I find not the feedback I wish 
you were just talking about. And um, so what I'm wondering about is then that this rather bottom-up approach, I think as you almost evoke it in the, the way you discuss it, is torpedoed by the idea then that we're in a post-industrial area where we have anyhow a tabula rasa condition in which we plant and just that pattern. So, and I think there's for me the glitch in the project, that on one hand we assume the tabula rasa, at the same time we think a, a hyper-complexity of a relational landscape uh, and the complexity of the environment, right? And so that's where for me that a slip happens within the project. And that's where I think also almost you um, defining for yourself not the chance really to click, to have these two more interactive. Um, so my wondering is, um, could it be that one would study, uh, let's say, um, watersheds and whatnot, um, traditional, right? But then arrive from there at a certain comprehension of patterns as they actually exist in nature or are evoked through natural processes, and then utilize those as, um, you know, of turning those into design components. So it's essentially I would uh, upside down to maybe what you do right now, I don't know, as it looks to me today. And I wonder whether that you see a chance in it, perhaps, and then that could be, um, yeah, maybe another generation of the project you're having already uh, underway. I mean, I'll take the, the tower's way out. Uh, in, in, the sense, in the sense that it's a good choice. I know. <laughs> I know. Just, just play that. Uh, no, I, 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 in a lot of ways, I, I agree with you. Um, but I agree with you um, that maybe those are other projects, and I don't think there's one way to think about context and what the responses might be, or the method of the generation. And I think the all of the projects that we framed. Um, and we showed today, that they tend to be in kind of radically isolated environments, and the issues in some way of the kind of larger watershed mapping and kind of generating from that really don't greatly impact them because of their uh, disjunctive nature. But in some way, then there's a, I think, a, a logic for what we were responding to in the Naked Law Project is that you know, there's a, a material context um, in the fact of, of using the uh, customized geocells, etc., there's an economic context uh, that we're responding to. The idea that you know these have to be uh, easy to install, they have to be very cheap, and very low maintenance. Um, but there's, uh, I think, there's also a, a, a context of almost a context of inevitability that the mandates have already been brought into play that these things are going to happen in these lots and, and in these types of sites and to get ahead of that in some way to maybe open up what the avenues and ranges of expression can be because quite frankly they're really limited in the knowledge. I mean maybe I have one reservation maybe. Uh, so we have, I mean, have the maybe we should actually ask for other questions yes. before we start. I have, we talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There'll be time after us. <laughs> This is uh, not a good idea to continue that point, but I just wanted to say, you know, that the model you have described is precisely the George Hargreaves model, and that's the way it's been done in landscape uh, in the 80s, where, for instance, the Guadalupe River Park, where it entails taking down an engineer's wall and inserting a new, a new flow of water, guided now by forms that were derived from a model that was hydrological, it was exactly, and it was modeled in play, and it was then translated into an appropriate scale. It's exactly the, the, what you described. I situate the work, work that David and Karen and, and um, Keith are doing in a completely different conversation. And my question, uh, because it is, it, it is in fact against that in a way, I mean, it is proposing a very different uh, a very different um, interdisciplinary context uh, through which to to uh, generate the work. But I, my question then has to do with what is your evaluation criteria? Right? How do you know that you've arrived uh, at the right or, you know, ornament, uh, at the right uh, is if, if you propose that it's visual? Um, how do you scale it? And then secondly, we know that uh, uh, 
things respond to light and shadow and whiteness, things that, that are not necessarily brought into uh, the project. Can you project beyond the thing itself, beyond the wall and its vegetation or the surface and, and its vegetation and soil, uh, to, um, to describe or to project uh, other forms of subjectivity that may come out of those surfaces that can be generated. And I'm mean, thinking here uh, it's, uh, specifically about, um, I just visited the, um, the Ground Zero uh, Memorial, and I had seen that very simple plan, had heard um, uh, Peep describe it, as well as Ron Mara describe it here. And yet when I went to the memorial two weeks ago, in a bright, sunny afternoon at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, in the afternoon, I was <laughs> shocked at the, the actual the color and the interplay of shade and how it shifted every single surface in a way I could not have measured or understood from its representation. And the way I photographed that site, you, you will never know that that was the site, I mean, the, the two squares. So there's a level of where the poetics, you know, and what we do arises that, that is about this dynamic that stands above and beyond. Uh, and, and how do you, whether that plays a part in what we do? I mean, we certainly hope it plays a part, but it's hard to evaluate um, a hypothetical design project by those criteria, which are all, often always surprising in terms of the experience you had at that particular moment, the temporality of actually being in the landscape. But um, to answer the question about how do you evaluate it, even as a hypothetical proposal, um, I mean, I think in some ways we maybe ask some conventional questions that we expect of that our public landscapes could do in terms of does it have um, variety to support a wide array of activity? Does it have kind of sensual variety so that it's not a homogenous, top-down mm -hmm. kind of pattern? So um, even though um, and, you know, I just showed a very small part of the um, how the project was designed, it has to still be judged by the criteria of um, this is in the desert art, is there a place are you in the shade? In the and some people were dealing explicitly with light as their as how to transform the kind of ornamental structure. So the inhabitation of the landscape is integral to how those projects are thought, how the ornament is transformed. I don't know if that answers the question. We have time for one more question, I think, over there. Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. It's fine. <laughs> speakers maybe touched on how pattern is meant to kind of allow for the perception of the process. And I'm wondering at what point or what point of scale does this perception cease to exist? Like a lot of these pattern uh, projects are kind of at an installation scale and I'm wondering, you know, when it gets to maybe an urban or regional scale, are these patterns, do they allow for the perception process anymore? Just, just to clarify, I don't think I mentioned what happened. <laughs> 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 um, sorry. <laughs> but, okay. Um, you know, I think one of the, kind of, I think it was in the early 90s, that a book that um, Jim Corner and Alice McQueen came up and it came up, it made very, very clear to us that actually the way in which we you know, colonize the landscape has a, you know, I mean, that was part of the spectacle of those series of images that was so clearly a, a kind of a, a systemic pattern based. And I do think that in many ways, that when you're talking about territorial scales or even urbanism, you are to some extent talking about patterns. But I, don't, but I think you've got to be careful that it's not necessarily just graphic patterns, but they actually embed within certain system patterns, patterns of systems. Along those lines. So I think that's probably, uh, I do think that at the large regional scales, there is a, there is a role that patterns uh, do play. Just not, graphic, not necessarily just graphic. Um, that's a very good um, question. Um, again, we couldn't really explain the, the projects in depth 
we're not suggesting that some of the large scale organizations are perceptible as a pattern all at once, meaning an organizational pattern. But the way the landscape was constructed to house these particular environments that recur, meaning you'd start to understand the structure of the landscape in relation to topography based on that kind of repetition. I don't know if that makes sense, but the overall organization is not perceptible at once once you get to a, a large scale. But you still might be able to convey some notion of a topography which is perceptibly flat, but by how you're dealing with the repetition of water in relation to forest or water flow and constructed wetland, you start to see see a pattern which is more temporal in nature. Thank you very much. I think with that, um, we'll close the session. Thank, Thank you again you. for all the questions.